I'll, I'll start with this. Do you know any happy people? Okay, think about it for a moment. Who is the happiest person that you know? Right, that person uh, who always seems to have a smile on their face, even annoyingly, right? Um, they never complain. They always have something good to say. They're in a, a constant state of being calm, cool, and collected. And they're not fake, right? Uh, there are some people who act happy, but you can kind of tell uh, there's something else going on there, right? But then there are some people who you know are just genuinely happy, and so who do you know who is like that? Uh, a follow-up question would be, have you ever asked them why they're so happy? I mean, if, if you knew somebody who was genuinely happy all the time, or at least most of the time, wouldn't you want to know their secret? Isn't that what much of the world today is, is desperately looking for? The secret to happiness, uh, and if you look at magazine covers, uh, blog headlines, uh, you'll find that there are some people who even claim that they have found, they've discovered the secret to happiness. Uh, listen to these. Try the six science-backed secrets to happiness. The secret of happiness revealed by Harvard study. 27 habits to help you live a happier life. How to be happy. 10 extremely practical tips to try now. Uh, these are all web page titles that popped up when I did a search in the Google machine. Um, so many different uh, things that popped up. And, and what these show is that there isn't actually any congruency on what makes us happy. Uh, are there six things we need to do, or 10, or 27? Which is it, right? We don't know. Uh, but there is one thing that all of these articles did agree upon, um, which is that happiness and self-care, everybody say self-care, self are closely linked to one another. That, that's what these articles say. That part of our happiness depends on the nature and the quality of how well we care for ourselves. Uh, self-care is a huge topic in our modern world right now, isn't it? Just type that phrase in, self-care, in any search engine, and it will deliver billions, no joke, billions of search results in less than a second. Um, and they're all, mo the majority of them are talking about how important self-care is and why we need to pursue self-care for ourselves, right? Government websites, medical websites, psychology websites, white papers written up on this, educational websites that all talk about the importance of self-care. But here's a serious question. If we seem to have cracked the secret to a happier life, and self-care has something to do with it, then why is happiness, at least in the West, on a downward trend? Since 2011, uh, the well-known Gallup polling group, um, they've been keeping track of happiness on a global scale. I don't know how they did this, but we trust our pollsters, right? Um, maybe not. Anyways. <laughs> But since 2011, uh, they've been keeping track of, of, of uh, happiness all across the world. And in North America, for example, happiness in general has gone down 5.18% uh, compared to happiness recorded in 2011. Uh, and younger people, especially, uh, younger people are being hit harder with unhappiness than the other age groups and demographics. According to another recent study, a decade's worth of personality change uh, happened during the 2019 to 22, 22 time period. Uh, this study showed that people are more neurotic, uh, which means that they have a tendency to see the world as uh, distressing or unsafe. Do you feel more neurotic since 2019? Uh, since that time, uh, people are less conscientious than just a couple of years ago. Researchers found that young adults, so that's those 30 and under, experience the most change, um, but each age group showed these downward trends. Now, granted, there was a global pandemic scare, right? Uh, massive political and cultural upheavals during this time period. But again, this has been going on since 2011. So what's going on? What's happening? Is the world not taking self-care seriously as the experts say they should be? Uh, I don't think that's it either. Uh, the self-care industry is valued at $1.5 trillion. That is a stupid number, okay? 
$1.5 trillion, which means that, that people are spending crazy amounts of money on things that are considered self-care. Okay, and the, the industry, according to the industry, self-care is anything that brings us joy. If it, if it makes us happy, then it's worth whatever price we pay for it, whether it's with our time or money. Uh, or another kind of definition of, of self-care is anything that you can do for yourself in the moment that will put you in a better position in the future. So I don't think the problem is that people are not taking self-care seriously, if that $1.5 trillion uh, estimate is true. I, I think we actually have maybe an unhealthy obsession with self-care. And so I, I think the problem is with the idea of self-care altogether, that the world's understanding of and the world's pursuit of self-care is actually leading to more harm than happiness. Um, but Christians, too, are being sucked into a self-care ideology that I believe is actually robbing them of the true joy and happiness that God actually desires for us to have. And we actually see God lay out for us a formula for self-care um, in Scripture. It looks very different from the world's version of self-care. Uh, what we see in Scripture, and this is kind of my bottom line, I'm going to say this over and over again, is that God's formula for self-care comes in the form of what I'm coining as selfless care. Selfless care. Okay, and today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the happiest, most fulfilled, and satisfied person to ever live as an example to see what God's formula of self-care really looks like. And so the title of today's message is Selfless Care. Uh, can we pray uh, one more time before we continue with our message? Lord, we are grateful for you. We've been singing it all morning. We praise you, God. You are worthy of our affection. You are worthy of our attention. You are worthy of our obedience. And so, God, as we look at, at the scriptures and as we see what your word says about self-care, and more specifically, selfless care, would you help us to receive your word? God, I know that even just in, in preparing this message for the past couple of weeks, um, this is going to step on some toes. And so, Lord, my desire is that people would not hear me, but they would hear your heart, God, your father heart for true care and what you want to do in our lives. And so would you lead us? Would you guide us? Would you prepare us to receive all that you have for us this morning, God? We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Okay, everybody take a, a self-care deep breath. Okay, ready? <gasps> Breathe out. Here we go. All right, so, so back, back to my first two questions I asked at the beginning. Uh, who is the happiest person that you know? And what is the secret to their happiness? Now, I'm going to argue that the happiest person that you know is actually uh, the same person for all of us, okay? Um, it's just that we don't typically think of him in these terms, which is really sad, um, but the happiest person that we all know and who's actually the happiest person to ever walk the earth is Jesus. You didn't see that coming, did you? It's Jesus, okay? Think about it. What are some of the, the qualifiers that we use to determine if somebody is happy? We use words like content, satisfied, fulfilled, easygoing, joyful, right? True, true happiness. These are just a, a few examples. Now, do you think Jesus was happy while here on earth? Absolutely, he was happy. Absolutely. He was happy, the happiest person to walk the earth. And I'm pretty sure um, that you, because Jesus was perfect, right? Jesus was perfect. And if happiness isn't included in being perfect, I don't want to be perfect, right? Could we all agree with that? So, so Jesus was absolutely the happiest person to walk the earth. Um, he was content. He was content to do the will of the Father. He, he perfectly fulfilled his purpose, and he was thus truly satisfied in life. Uh, you never read a verse where Jesus is running or hurrying from one place to the next. Even when there were these urgent matters before him and his disciples were reacting and overreacting, trying to get him to hurry, Jesus kept this constant state of calm, cool, and collected. For example, 
sleeping on a boat in the middle of a storm. Who does that? The happiest person to ever live does that. Right? Taking his time to heal the woman with the issue of blood in this crowded city when he was supposed to be on his way to Jairus' daughter who was about to die, he, he healed her. Or, or waiting a couple of days to travel to see his, his dear friend Lazarus even though he knew he was about to die. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus was never sad, that, that he was never in pain or anguish. Jesus wept when he heard that his friend Lazarus had died. Before his, his final entry into Jerusalem, before he went to the cross, we see this scene where Jesus is, is crying over, over Jerusalem because he knew Israel would reject him as the Messiah altogether. He was in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane to the point of sweating drops of blood. The Bible refers to Jesus actually as the man of sorrows. But you can experience sorrow, you can experience grief, which is part of the human experience, and also be the happiest person to ever live. It's possible. Yeah. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. I've got a ton of scriptures for you. I would encourage you to write them down. You won't be able to turn to them uh, as I'm going through them. Write them down, then, then look them up throughout the week, okay? But Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is a, a prophetic psalm about Jesus. And so it says this, but the son, but to of the son, that's Jesus, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever the scepter of uprightness. Uh, I'm sorry, the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Verse nine, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness Beyond your companions. Who are Jesus' companions? You and me, the rest of humanity. And what this saw or proverb is, or I'm sorry, what Hebrews is saying is that Jesus was anointed by God with the oil of gladness that was greater than all of the rest of humanity. He was the happiest person to ever live and walk the earth. But not only is Jesus the happiest person to have ever existed, um, he also wants us to experience his exact same joy in our lives. Yeah. Okay, think about his advent. I can't believe that it's almost Christmas, can you? Oh my gosh. But think about his advent. Let's start getting into the Christmas season. Um, his coming into the world. When it was revealed to Mary, Elizabeth, the wise men, the shepherds, Simeon and Anna, that the Messiah had been born, they all had the same response. Yeah. Exceedingly great joy. Right. Exceedingly great joy. Uh, even Elizabeth's unborn child, John the Baptist, leapt for joy in her womb when Mary, pregnant with the Messiah, Jesus, walked into the room. Yeah. Listen, God cares about your happiness, and our happiness is fulfilled in Jesus, yeah. the happiest of all persons. Yeah. Uh, Jesus himself speaks of his desire for his followers to share in his joy. Uh, listen to, to John chapter 15, verse 11. This is what Jesus says. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that whose joy? My joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus himself was the most joy-filled and happiest person to ever, uh, whoever was and, and will be, so much so that he doesn't want his followers to experience just any joy. You can probably find some kind of joy in this world if you, if you tried hard enough. But that's not enough for Jesus. He doesn't want you to experience any joy. He wants you to experience his perfect joy. Right. Wrap your brains around that, people. Yeah. That is incredible. Right? He wanted them to experience his joy, the anointing of the oil of gladness beyond anyone or anything else. And so Jesus was and still is the happiest person to ever walk the earth. Right? I say is because he's still alive. Amen. Right? We also see that he wants us to experience not just any joy, but his joy. He cares about our happiness. But what's his secret? Back to the second question. How did he and how do we achieve that perfect happiness? Because if we look at Jesus' life, all of the, the typical things that the world associates with being happy, listen, Jesus never experienced. He didn't experience those things. Uh, Jesus, as far as we, we know uh, from the scriptures, he didn't have a penny to his name. 
by the world standards today, he was dirt poor. He was poor. He didn't own a house or any land. He depended entirely on God who provided to him through other people to support his ministry his entire life. And so his happiness, it didn't come from money or material things. Do you see that? Uh, Jesus was never married and he never had any children. So his happiness, it didn't come from having a spouse or children. Again, he was never married and never sinned, so we know he didn't gain happiness from sexual pleasure. He never experienced that. Jesus, he had a vocation, uh, but it was purely nonprofit, so to speak, and it was geared entirely toward the service of others. Uh, let's then think about self care, uh, something that the world agrees plays a major part in happiness. What did Jesus do for self care? Did he sleep in every now and then? Now, we don't know really, but what we do know for sure is his regular routine, which he daily woke up early in the morning to spend time with God. We see that all throughout the Gospels. Uh, Did Jesus make sure he got enough alone time? Any introverts in the house need your alone time, right? I am. Did he he make sure he got enough alone time? Well, Jesus often uh, went away for times of solitude all by himself, but during those times, he wasn't taking part in his like favorite hobbies. Right? He wasn't binge-watching Netflix or, or figuring out what's happening on X or anything like that, right? His times of solitude were, again, devoted to prayer and worship to his Father. Yeah. Uh, even on the Sabbath, the one day of rest during the week set aside by God for us, Jesus would go to the synagogue to worship, pray, read Scripture, and teach. Uh, he would heal the sick, and he was pretty much constantly around other people all the time, including on the Sabbath. Now, again, if you're an introvert like me, this doesn't sound anything like a day of rest at all, does it? No. And so as far as we can tell from Jesus' life, he wasn't very good at self the world's standards. In fact, his life and daily activities are summed up pretty well by Romans chapter 15, verse 3, where Paul says, for Christ did not please himself. For Christ did not please himself. And Paul is using Jesus as an example for us, saying that we shouldn't purely please ourselves, but we should please our neighbors, please the people around us. Jesus is this perfect example of someone who practiced the spiritual discipline of self-surrender, of self-denial at all times. If you want to learn more about that that spiritual discipline that we don't learn much about, a shameless plug, I wrote a book on it. And if you want to learn more about it, I can point you in the direction to that book and you can read it. Cool? All right. Um, So how is it then uh, that Jesus didn't seem to practice any kind of self-care, but lived a life totally devoted to serving God and serving others, and yet he's also the happiest person to ever walk the earth. If self-care wasn't part of Jesus' normal practice, then what's his secret to supreme happiness? Again, what we see in Jesus' life, as well as in the scriptures, is that God's formula for self-care comes in the form of selfless care. Right? That the greatest thing you can actually do for yourself is to think about and care about others more than you think and care about yourself. Okay, here's some more scriptures. I'm going to get a drink of water because I sang like crazy during worship and I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm just going to read these off. They speak for themselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of of others. And as that, that verse from Philippians that we just read, as it indicates, it's not wrong to look after your interests. It's not wrong to look after your interests. We need to make sure that we are healthy, right? We need to make sure that our lives and our families, our homes, that they're in order. We need to make sure that our minds and our bodies are fit. 
But if we are counting our self-care as more significant than the care of others, then scripture is clear that we have our priorities wrong. Right. Right? Selfless care, meaning care for others, should always be our priority. And, and what God shows us in his word is that it is through selfless care that we actually receive care for ourselves. Provision and care comes when we practice selfless care towards others. Well, how does that work, Pastor Kai? Well, in Mark chapter 6, and we're going to hang out in this story for a little bit. And so if you'd like to turn there and and follow along, I'm not going to read all the scriptures. Um, But in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30, uh, we see that the apostles, right, the, the 12 men appointed by God to train and equip for the work of ministry in the world, right, right before he would leave. Um, but the, the 12 apostles, they just returned to Jesus after a period of like nonstop ministry. Jesus sent them out. They were casting out demons, preaching the gospel, the kingdom of God come. They, they were serving people nonstop, and they just returned to Jesus. And so when they return, Jesus says, hey, you know what, guys? Um, let's get away by ourselves uh, to, to somewhere where there's, there's not going to be a lot of people, where it can be just me and you guys, and let's get away for some rest. Right, you've been working hard. You need to rest. Right, so even Jesus acknowledges that rest is good. We need it, right? So they all get in a boat, and they head somewhere. Jesus calls it, or, or uh, Mark writes it down as a desolate place, meaning there, there's not a whole lot there, nobody there. Um, So they get in this boat, head somewhere where they can have a little getaway, a little vacay, a little bro time, if you will, Um, some time to rest and respite and just hanging out with one another. Um, And that sounds pretty good, right? Especially if it's with Jesus. I want to do that. Um, But when they get to their destination, they are met by thousands of people, thousands of people who saw them get in the boat and cross this body of water, and they like ran to try and meet them on the other side. Thousands of people wanting to hear Jesus teach and see him perform miracles. And what does Jesus do? Sorry, everyone. Me and the boys, we're just here for a weekend of rest and and relaxation, just a little bit of self-care, you know what I mean? And so I'm not going to teach today. I've got no miracles for you. You should all just go home. Right? Okay, listen. If Jesus agrees with the world's notion that self-care is so important, then we would expect him to send everyone away. If Jesus is considering the mental well-being and mental health of his apostles, then he as a leader should honor their boundaries and postpone ministry until they're well-rested, right? None of that happens. None of that happens. Instead, it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, that Jesus had compassion on the masses. He had compassion on them. So he started to teach them and shepherd them. Now, what is Jesus prioritizing here? Self-care or selfless care? And so Jesus, he teaches for a really long time, and the apostles, they start to notice that it's getting late. Um, They tell Jesus, hey, it's getting late, rabbi. It's getting late, master. How about we send all of these people away to a nearby village so that they can, you know, refresh, get something to eat, right? Because there's nothing around here in this desolate place. Now, it it might sound like the apostles are being compassionate, that they're being loving and kind and and considerate of all of these people, wanting to make sure that they don't go hungry. Um, But I suspect that their motives are more selfish than selfless. Now, I can't prove it explicitly from uh, the, the scriptures, from the passage, but I just have a hunch. Okay, so follow along with me. Because why did they come to this place to begin with? Rest with Jesus. Um, And did they get to rest with Jesus? No. They were thrust right back into ministry mode, serving mode. Now, do you think the apostles might have been a little peeved that Jesus would take them away from rest, but then thrust them right back into ministry as soon as they got to their destination? I suspect yes, because you know what? I would be peeved at Jesus too, okay? And we all would too. We'd be like, ah, come on, Jesus. And so I suspect that the disciples were actually trying to just get rid of the people so that they could finally hang out with Jesus and rest. They were trying to take self-care into their own hands and on their own terms. Because listen, the crowds were not considering them in that moment. 
And surprisingly, Jesus, their leader, didn't protect their rest time either. So I think what they're doing is they're just trying to get rid of the crowd for selfish reasons. I think they're trying to take self-care into their own hands. And I suspect that Jesus knew the apostles' intentions as well because of his response to them. Right? The apostles say, let's send them away. And Jesus says, we don't need to send them away. You feed them. You feed them. More work, more ministry, more serving. You feed them. Okay, good teachers never miss the opportunity to teach. And what happens next is Jesus performs this incredible miracle. He takes five loaves of bread and two fish, multiplies it so that it feeds at least 5,000 men. And we don't know how many women and children were also present on top of that. And the feeding of the 5,000 is this wonderful and well-known miracle of Jesus's. But there's some depth to this story. Because like I said, good teachers never miss an opportunity to teach. And this story... The story isn't just about the miracle. It's not just about the miracle, but what Jesus was trying to teach the apostles in that moment. Because Jesus, listen, Jesus wasn't disregarding their need for rest and care. He was trying to show them a better way. He was trying to show them a better way. He was showing them that if... um, That when you you trust him, when you trust in his ways, when you practice this formula of self-care, which comes in the form of selfless care, he's going to provide for you. And we see exactly that in the story. Because after the uh, the apostles were were working again, serving again, uh, caring for others before themselves, they were distributing all of the food. And after the masses were fed and satisfied by, by this meal that they passed out, Mark chapter 6, verse 43, it says this. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. How many apostles were there? 12. How many baskets of fish were left over? 12. One basket for each of them. And so it was through providing and caring for all of these other people that Jesus provided and cared for his friends, his disciples. This is, in, this is amazing. Do you think Jesus can and wants to do this for you too? Yeah. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, it says this. The generous will proper, uh, prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Just read that again for yourself. You see, when it comes to self-care and happiness, the world says, you look after you, right? Any Parks and Rec fans? Treat yourself, right? (laughs) Don and Tom, they have their treat yourself day, right? (laughs) No one is going to care for you better than you can care for yourself. That's what the world says. But Jesus shows us a better way, and his way actually works and delivers every single time. God's care for us often comes through our caring for others. And the applications of this principle that we see all throughout Jesus' life, and if we look through the New Testament, even the Old Testament, we'll see it everywhere. Um, The applications are pretty broad. Think about our church. Okay, what would happen if each one of us considered everyone else above ourselves? Or like we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, always seeking to do good to one another and to everyone. What would happen? I think that we would see uh, what we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 20, 47, where the early church was selling all of their possessions and pooling their resources and providing to anyone who had need. The early church also had these incredible experiences of the presence of God, as well as many miracle signs and wonders. Now, we in the the Pentecostal charismatic movement, um, we idealize, I'm not going to say idolize, but we idealize the Acts chapter 2 early church. Okay, but listen, they didn't become like that just through a dramatic infilling of the Holy Spirit, but also through a dramatic emptying of the self 
and a radical dedication to selfless care. And that passage in Acts says that if anyone had need, their needs were met. And we can assume that 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 means the needs of those who are being sacrificial and giving, their needs were met too. And if we practice the same kind of selfless care as a church family, man, we would experience this kind of radical generosity and, and needs being met. We'd experience more of the presence of God. We'd experience miracles, signs, and wonders being done in our midst, all to the glory of God. Now listen, I'm not saying that we're not doing that. This isn't a condemnation. I don't want you to hear that. Man, worship this morning, I heard you louder than I could hear what was going on in my ears right now. You were sacrificing. You were bringing praises and sacrifice to God. And I think that was a really incredible holy moment. Right, so this isn't a condemnation of you. Um, But we can always get better, right? We could always do do more. Um, What about in marriage? What if each spouse was dedicated to selflessly caring for the other? If in my house, I was always trying to satisfy my wife's Annette's needs, and she's always trying to satisfy mine, and if we're both successful in doing that, then what's going to happen? Both of our needs are going to be met without us individually having to try and meet those needs ourselves. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, listen, 99.99% of the problems in marriage arise from a selfishness from one spouse, but usually both spouses at some point. Every single fight and argument that Annette and I have ever had, I can probably trace it back to some kind of selfishness. Probably can't. I can trace it back to one of of us prioritizing self over the other, right? But if a husband and a wife are dedicated to God's formulas for self-care, which comes in the form of selfless care, I promise you, you are going to have an incredible marriage. I promise you. You will have this, this unity, this incredible love for one another. Now, it's not easy, right? It takes a lot of work and patience, and time, and getting it wrong, and mercy, and grace, and repentance, and forgiveness. But if you keep at this practice of selfless care in marriage, it will absolutely pay off. It will pay off. Uh, What about at work or in school? What does selfless care look like there? Well, it looks, it's really simple, okay? Um, It looks like submitting to your authority and doing the best work that you can do. I think this is an old-fashioned uh, kind of thought that we've lost in our modern day, especially us millennials, okay? Um, if you go into work with the mindset of what can I get out of this rather than what can I put into this, you are going to be miserable. Yeah. Yep. You're going to be miserable. Yeah. Why? Because your place of work is going to let you down. Yeah. Your boss is going to let you down. Your coworkers are going to let you down. Your employees are going to let you down. And if you're trying to get something out of these flawed environments, then you're going to be very disappointed. Are you following what I'm saying, church family? But if you think more about what you can do for your boss, I don't care how terrible they are. If you think more about what you can do for your coworkers, your employees, your teachers, your professors, if you selflessly sow into your place of work or school, then God's principles of sowing and reaping are going to be activated in your life. That's good. Right? Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Write this one down for sure. Go and read it this week. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap, whether good or bad. Jesus says it this way in Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. Jesus goes into like the slam poetry kind of thing right there. (laughs) right? And then he finishes, for with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you, right? Right. Are you sowing selfishness 
or selflessness in your life. You're going to know by what's being given back to you, by what you're reaping in your own life. This practice of selfless care, listen, it also serves our mental health incredibly well. God cares about your mental health. And he wants you to be well in body and in mind. But his way is supremely better than our own ways in the world's ways. Yeah. Okay, in Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew, um, he starts talking about anxiousness and anxiety. Now, this is, a, is probably the number one mental health struggle in our world today, isn't it? If I ask you how many of us experienced anxiety this week, every single one of us would raise our hand probably. And there are good chances that there's a good amount of us who experienced anxiety to the point of being overwhelmed and almost debilitating. There's a good chance of that. Well, in Jesus' sermon, he talks about anxiety and he gives us a remedy for anxiety. It's not medication and it's not counseling. Okay, now listen, all right? I want you to hear me very carefully. Everybody look at me right now. I am not against counseling. I am not against medication, if that's what you need. And Jesus isn't against that either. I am so thankful for the counselors and the tools that they've given my wife, for example, who's been through the ringer with postpartum depression. I am incredibly thankful for them. But even my wife will tell you that counseling is a supplement. Counseling is a supplement to her life and that what Jesus prescribes is primary and so much better. And so in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, Jesus, he starts listing out uh, some things that we could choose to be anxious about. Where's my food and drink going to come from? What about my clothes? What about my body, my health? Like, What's going to happen tomorrow and the next day? And so Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about all these things. And you know what? Your heavenly father actually knows very well that you need these and he's gonna take care of you. But he has a formula that he wants you to follow. So instead of being anxious, do this instead, Jesus says. Matthew chapter six, verse 33. You've heard it before. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Now, real quickly, three things about this verse. First, there's an instruction in this verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? It means learn everything that you can about the kingdom of God that you belong to. Right? Who is our king? And what is he all about? Right? And then align your life with the customs of that kingdom, which is righteousness. Right? Do what the king asks of you. Obey his laws and commands. Live as a citizen of heaven should live. And if it's not been made clear, the kingdom of God and his righteousness is all about loving God and loving other people and not so much about self, right. just to make sure that's, that's clear. So we have this instruction. Second thing about this verse is that it gives the importance of this instruction. When should we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? First, first, first. Right, so the kingdom of God and his righteousness shouldn't be this afterthought that we eventually get to. Right? It, it should be primary. It should be at the forefront of our minds all of the time. It's not going to help us very well if we, decide, if we choose to be anxious and we try and fix things and, and make things happen all on our, on, our, on our own and then we finally think, oh yeah, uh, I gotta remember the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not gonna work. It's not, that's not how it works. Seek First, seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to. So we have instruction, we have importance. The third thing that we have is a result. If we follow God's instructions and we make seeking his kingdom and his righteousness the greatest priority in our lives, which is loving God and loving people, then he promises there will be a result. What is that result? God is going to care for you personally. God is going to care for you personally. Jesus says it this way, and all of these things will be added to you. What does all of these things refer to? It's all of these things that we're being anxious about. Everything that Jesus listed off, it'll be added to you, he's saying. 
And if God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, is providing all of your needs, and he's taking care of you personally better than you can take care of yourself, do you think you're going to be anxious? No, probably not. Now, in what we just talked about, how much self-care is involved in God's formula here? Zero. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which has nothing to do with self, And then all of these things will be added to you. Here it is again. God's formula for self-care comes in the form of selfless care. Do you see it? Have I presented my argument thoroughly this morning? And if we apply this to every single aspect of our lives and others in our community, in our family, in our friendship, if they're doing the same thing around us, I promise you, Our church will be better because of it. Your marriage will be better because of it. Your workplace, your school environment, it's going to be better because of it. Listen, your mental health will be better because of it because Jesus promises it. And if this is how Jesus lived his entire life and he was still the happiest person to ever walk the earth, I bet you that we're going to be happier because of it too. It's like the cherry on top. And so to wrap up, and Stephanie, you can come on up. So to wrap up, what are you practicing more in your life? Self-care or selfless care? And how is that going for you? If you're making self-care a greater priority in your life and you don't find yourself getting any happier, it's time to do something different. It's time to change it up. Right? Try God's way. Make selfless care a greater priority and see the wonders that God does with you. Right? Trust that God will be faithful to his words and that he'll care for you in the way that only an almighty God and loving father ever could. It's so much better. It's so much better.